Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. If you don't have a Bible, look on with somebody. If you have a Bible and can't find it, just open your Bible to the middle. Nobody will know. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. It reads just like this. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and sultry in symphony with all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Come on now. Amen. Do me a favor. Do me a favor and look at your neighbor and just say holy defiance. Come on, look at him. Holy defiance. You got him. holy defiance. Holy defiance. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Oh, God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. The song in our heart says, thank you, Lord, because you've been so good. Because you've made ways over and over again. Because you watched over us. You've taken care of us. There is no God like our God. So, God, we ask right now that you might speak to our hearts, that you might preach to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the call that you've given us. And now we ask that we might answer it in faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. They call them strong-willed children. They're children that are naturally defiant. You don't have to get them to stand up and stand alone. They do that all by themselves. But for most of us, it can be difficult to stand alone. It can be difficult to be the outsiders when everybody else seems to be on the inside. It can be difficult to step away from the crowd and decide you're going to do what only you can do and what you have to do. For most of us, it is a hard thing to stand alone. Amen. In fact, for all of us, you at some point had to stand seemingly by yourself. You had to do it with people looking at you and wondering why you were doing what you were doing, but you had to do it. Okay, y'all don't have to be honest. I remember when I was in college, freshman, maybe sophomore year, I was asked to be an RA. And that was a pretty big thing because I got a discount on my living quarters. Well, it was junior year, I was moved to the quads. And that's where the athletes lived. One in particular who was a great athlete, a big, tall, strong basketball player. He decided that he wanted to smoke a little something in his room. Well, I was the RA, and he was about three, foot, three feet taller than me, so I had to go see him. And he answered the door, and seemed a little dazed, I don't know why. He said, what's up, Rhea? I said, look, man, you can't smoke that here anymore. If you do it, you know I got to turn you in. Well, very next week, I smelled that same strange, not a tobacco smell. I don't know what it was, smell, and I had to go turn him in. The campus police showed up. He was our starting basketball player, the center. The girls loved him. Yeah, he, he was a superstar. And so, of course, I became terribly shunned. Folk didn't want to look at me, speak to me. They were talking about me. People I thought were my friends, even my chess buddies, didn't want to hang out with me. It's hard when you have to stand up and seemingly stand alone. But I've come by to tell you that God says, every now and then, when the culture contradicts Christ, we have to decide to stand even by ourselves. Her name is Malala. She was a young girl at the time. She was about 15. 
She lived in a place where girls were not allowed to go to school. She insisted on going to school and her family encouraged her to. She began blogging and telling others that girls should go to school too. One day she was on the bus and someone boarded the bus and they called out, Malala. They shot her point blank three times. One hit her skull, one hit her arm, and one missed. She certainly was going to die, but she lived. And she's still traveling the world, telling the world that ladies deserve to be educated too. At some point, you will have to stand alone. At some point, you'll have to take a stand that's not popular. At some point, in order to stand with Christ, you're going to have to be isolated from the crowd. This is the testimony in our text. In our text, we are introduced to really four Hebrew boys. Daniel, or Belshazzar. Then you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And here they are. They've been summoned now to bow before a 90-foot tall and 9 feet wide golden statue. And, and this was the thing to do. In fact, there was a massive crowd of thousands of people, and they all bowed down, except for the three. They stood and watched everybody else bow. You know, whenever you're doing something right, somebody is going to say something wrong. I don't know if they weren't bowing or they were bowing and looking, but the satrap said, uh, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, great king, we want you to know there were some who aren't bowing to your golden image. They keep standing. Whoa, 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 whoa Nebuchadnezzar said. He was a man of authority and power who had a complex. Uh, he, he dealt with the self-worthiness complex. And so he said, tell me who they are. Now, he didn't just kill them because he knew their names. He knew that they were wise, they were nobles, they had been entrusted, and so he went to them. He said, hey guys, we worked together before. I know you and you know me. Uh, all you have to do is bow to the image. You, you really don't have to feel it in your heart or mean it in your spirit. All you have to do is what everybody else is doing. All you gotta do is go along to get along. Don't worry about it, everybody's doing it. And they responded simply by saying, oh, king, we are not careful in answering you, but we are absolutely clear and confident. King, we are not going to bow down to the golden image. And, and king, we know that our God is able to rescue us from whatever happens to us. But, but king, uh, if the Lord should decide that we're going to suffer whatever we suffer, we're willing to do it because we will not bow. And it's at that that they took a stand. And I want us to delve into their hearts and minds for just a little bit because I want to learn from them. I want to glean from them like Oprah Winfrey on an interview. What is it that they have that we need so we can stand when everybody else is going down? Wake your neighbor up. What is it that they have that, that we need so we can stand when everybody else is going along to get along? What is it that made them different? What is them that made them stay? What is it that made them stand out? Well, the first thing, if you look at the three Hebrew boys, the first thing that you will notice in their life that made them stand when everybody else was going down, they were able to stand because they had declared their allegiance. Would you say that to your neighbor? Declare your allegiance. No, you got to say it you like you mean it. Raise your head up and say it like you mean it. Come on. Declare your allegiance. Okay, maybe it's not clear. Uh, the first time I really almost got really beat down by the school bully, the first time, the first time I really almost got beat down by the school bully uh, is it, it, because uh, uh, the school bully, everybody knew them, but it was 3 o'clock, and I was supposed to go out and meet the school bully. But to me, it sort of caught me by surprise because the school bully, she was my girlfriend. And so I, I didn't understand why she would do this to me. And so I went to her, and I said, hey, look, baby boo, uh, why are you trying to uh, beat me up, Jamila? And she said, well, I found out that you're not telling anybody that 
that you're with me. You're, you're not telling anybody that you're my boyfriend, but I am your secret lover, and I'm not willing to have this kind of relationship, so I'm going to beat you up. I'll tell you the end of the story at another time. But the truth is, God, in a real sense, says if you're going to be able to stand in difficult times, then you have to declare your allegiance all the time. You have to be willing to say, I belong to God. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I serve an awesome Messiah. I know I'm in the Bible because the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 10, that if you deny me before your classmates, if you deny me before your lodge mates, if you deny me before your girlfriends and all the folk you are around, then I've got to deny you before my father. And, and Jesus, in fact, would repeat the same thing. All I'm trying to say, and actually now I'm trying to get in your face, not your face, but your neighbors. Are you telling the world about God? Are you, are you telling the world about Jesus Christ? Do the people who know you know that you love the Lord? That's the question. Somebody got to be the sweat come down right now. Wipe it. <laughs> Do the people who know you know that you're deeply committed to Jesus Christ? Uh, does your neighbor know that you're a fan of God? Does your neighbor know that you're a follower of the Savior? Do your employees know that you belong to the Lord? Does everybody who knows you know that you know God? That, that's why you got to be careful when you go to the club. And that's why you got to be careful when you do some of the things you ought not do. Because if you cannot tell them about God, then you should not be there or you should not be doing what you're doing. Everybody should know that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. You, you ought to be the one person in, in the lunch meeting who pauses and bows your head. Amen. Amen. And just let them look. Just let them look. And look, after a little while, somebody will sneak over to the side and say, I, I just know that you know something about the Lord. And I'm going into surgery. Watch, this will happen. I'm going into surgery. Can I ask you just to pray for me? Your supervisor, who had been mistreating you, will say, I, I know that you know the Lord. And I've got some trouble in my home. Can I ask you to pray for me? Don't you be ashamed of, of God. Don't you deny God. And you ought to use your Facebook and your Twitter to tweet somebody and tell them, not about some fine girl. Never mind, look you ought to tell them about God. Everybody who knows you should know that you know God. I know I'm in the Bible because the allegiance issue is throughout the book of Daniel. We forget that one of, if not the primary characters in the book of Daniel is not the three Hebrew boys. It is not uh, Daniel alone. But it's a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned 90 times in the book of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar kept vacillating between whether he wanted the real God or lesser gods. And so in chapter 1, you remember in chapter 1, uh, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys stood up and said, we won't eat this stuff uh, because they, were being, uh, they had allegiance to God. Uh, but then in chapter 2, uh, there's an image that, that Nebuchadnezzar is seen or shown in the vision. And he goes to Daniel and says, what is that image? And he said, that's a, a statue that tells the future. And so in response, Nebuchadnezzar built a statue, and this time he built himself. Because he was saying that his kingdom would stand forever. And so he was asking them to bow before him. And, and look, uh, the issue is, this is really the only issue that matters. Are you ready? This is really the only issue that matters. You will either serve other gods or you will serve the one and true living God. And the question is, have you declared your allegiance? That's the next one. First, you have to decide your allegiance, but then you have to declare your allegiance. I got that mixed up. You got to declare your allegiance. You have to tell the world that you belong to God, that you've chosen God, that he is your friend, that he is your savior, that he is ride or die with you. That you may not be perfect, you may have made some mistakes, but I belong to God. I, I, I'm a child of the king. I, Jesus is my savior. Jesus is the Lord. I, I don't have a sticker on the back of my car because I don't drive well enough, but I let everybody know that I belong to God. Look, you ought to have a sticker on the back of your life that says, I belong to God. Everybody needs to know that you know God. It's interesting when there's a homegoing celebration. The person would either be an avid follower of God or a comfortable, comfortable, common follower of God. The question is, what will be said about you? Are you a true, ride or died, sold out for God fan? Are you a follower of God? I, I, you know I follow sports, and I pick my team halfway through the year. I pick my team based on who's doing well. One day it's the 49ers. 
The other day, it might be the Falcons. But can I be honest with you? I'm convinced that a lot of Christians are just like that. If you're going through something in your life, or you need some breakthrough in your life, or somebody's sick in your life, oh, I'm a deep follower of God. He's everything to me. But when things are comfortable, when things are casual, when you got enough money and your kids are healthy and your marriage is all right, God, he doesn't have a priority. I'm challenging us because we have to decide that we will be like the three Hebrew boys, that we will be sold out, ride or die all the time. I belong to God. Amen. Doesn't matter where you catch me. At 3 a.m., I belong to God. Doesn't matter what day of the week, Sunday, Monday, Friday, Saturday, I belong to God. Doesn't matter the address you catch me on, I belong to God. I'm challenging all of us to put our heads up and our shoulders back and walk around Charlottesville telling the world, I belong to God. Amen. They decided their allegiance. Then they defined or declared their allegiance. They told the world who they serve. But not only that, if you're going to have the inner strength to do that, can I tell you, you need to develop an inner circle. Would you say that? Develop an inner circle. Oh, you didn't say it like you meant it. Develop an inner circle. Everybody can't be on the inside. Everybody can't be your advisory on your advisory board. Everybody can't be sowing into your spirit. Everybody can't know your heart. That's why it's so important who you let into your heart. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence. The three Hebrew boys and Daniel knew each other from their earliest connection. And they were always together. You never find one of them without the others. Because they understood that if we're going to stand strong, we have to stand together. The misnomer is if you're going to stand for God, that you always have to be alone. But can I tell you the truth is, whenever you find people who are standing for right or standing for God, they always have a few other people around them who got the same prayer life, who got the same commit, who got the same resolve. They're body body. You need some people in your life who are absolutely sold out, committed to God. You, you can't have all your circle and all your friends being casual saints. You need somebody who's on fire for the Lord. And this is because there'll come a day when your fire wax cold. And there'll come a day when you don't feel like doing what's right. There'll come a day when you want to pass too. There'll, there'll come a day when you want to preach too. There'll come a day when you want to do wrong too. There'll come a day when you want to cheat on your taxes too. You need somebody who will look at you and say, nah, we don't do that. Nah, you better than that. Nah, uh, you deserve a better man than that. Nah, you de deserve a better say. You need somebody who can encourage you to keep on keeping on. Amen. But if you surround yourself with low-class people, then when you need to make a high-class decision, I I'm not trying to be offensive. Uh, you, when you need to make a high-class decision or you need to walk in faith, or you need to know that God will help you through this circumstance, there will be nobody there. you got to surround yourself with some people who are on fire for God. No pun intended. you got to surround yourself with some people who will make hard decisions and make right decisions and help you make hard and right decisions. Okay. I told you I was an RA and I offended someone. And so for almost a year and a half, I was on the outs. I was on the outs. I, I, I was persona non grata. I, I wasn't invited to the stuff, and I wasn't popular. I still had uh, my, my free room and board, though, uh, but I wasn't popular. <laughs> well, I remember promise, promise. I won't give you all the details. Uh, I was called into the office, and there was the director of housing and a police officer. And they asked me, do you know about these drugs? Do you know about this, no disrespect, episode that happened in such and such night on such and such a room? I said, well, I, 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 I wanted to, to, to be an alpha. I mean, I, I, I don't know anything else about a train. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I have no idea of what you are implying. I, I wasn't there. I, I didn't know. I, I don't know the circumstances. What's going on? Well, several of those brothers were arrested because they engaged in activities that were bad, harmful, and dangerous. Look, even though I had to stand by myself, I stood in a safe place. Look, sometimes you will stand by yourself, but if you stand by yourself with the Lord, you will stand in a safe place. And look, if you wait a while, God will send other people to stand with you. 
if, you, if you're willing to stand by yourself, God will raise up some sisters and brothers who will stand with you. If you're willing to say, no, I won't engage in that, uh, God will send support to help you out. God will send somebody to get your back. It's a true story, and it's my story. I didn't get arrested, and I didn't get locked up. I, I didn't have to go that road because I did not hang out with that circle. You need to choose your circle wisely, and you need somebody who knows God. This isn't, this isn't just a casual, secret thing you got going on. You need a faith circle. You need somebody who can lift your faith. If everybody in your circle is weaker than you, then nobody will be able to help you. You need somebody who you can call at 3 a.m. just to talk to, and they won't tell anybody else. The reason we're falling and we're being harmed and hurt because we don't have a circle. We don't have anybody to sow into us. I see it all the time, people who are on fire and strong, and they seem so weak. And I'm wondering, do you have a circle of people who are pouring into you? Do you have a circle of believers who are believing God for you? Do you have people who you can text and get a prayer through? i got to continue. Amen. Develop, develop an inner circle. Come on now. Develop an inner circle. But not only do you need to... First, define and then declare your allegiance and develop an inner circle. This goes for all of us, young and old. But you need to develop a devotion life. Amen. If you look at the three Hebrews, three Hebrew boys and Daniel, you will note that they practice some very small but significant devotional practices. Man, I, I'm going the back door today. Uh, they, they practice some very small but significant devotional practices. If you are an athlete, you understand there are certain things that you do irregardless or regardless of the weather, regardless of if you have some event to happen or to go to, you just do it as a practice. It is your daily or your weekly routine. You'll never meet a professional athlete or a college athlete or, or anybody who's doing sports for real that don't systematically exercise. They, they even have a systematic diet. They even stretch. They do certain things and they always do it. Well, as Christians, we ought to be like that. Amen. Look at their devotional practices. They did it first around their diet. They, they did it around their diet. They would not eat certain things because they had made a covenant with God. They said, I won't do this. Now, God doesn't necessarily require that of us, but there are some other practices that we are required to engage in. Well, here's another one. They practice prayer. Amen. You remember when da Daniel got in trouble? He got in trouble because he had a consistent prayer life. His prayer life was so consistent that people could catch him praying. Some of us, we couldn't get caught praying. If people had to follow us around, they could not catch us praying. They had a consistent prayer life. And the good news about having a consistent prayer life, when you come into trouble, trial, and trauma, you don't have to do something new. You just do what you always do. And you know God will see you through there has to be some consistent devotional life. Let me give you one. Attending worship. Whether it's raining, whether it's Easter, Thanksgiving, Mother's Day, or whatever else. I go to worship. I go to church. I go because I understand it is a devotional practice. Amen. Now, some people would call it a discipline, but I don't use the word discipline. I use the word a devotion. Because my heart is so, and your heart should be so committed to God in response to his goodness, if I can make it into the house of worship, if I can walk, if I can get a bus, if I can get a cab, if I can get a donkey or a horse, I'm going to worship. Doesn't matter what state I'm in, doesn't matter what city I'm in, doesn't matter uh, how things are going in my life, I go to worship. And every now and then, the sermon might be so amazing, it blows my mind, or the song might be so great, I jump up and dance, but that's not why I go. I go because I am devoted. When you are devoted, you do it consistently. You show up. You know, the Bible says that Jesus went to church consistently, as was his habit. So if he was devoted to worship, we ought to be devoted to worship and the house of prayer. Can I give you another one? Studying the scriptures. Studying God's word should be our practice. We should know God's word. We should practice learning how to find the scriptures, memorize the scriptures, and understand the scriptures. And I know I've been in church all my life, or you've been in church all your life, but there's still something in there that God has for you. Make it your practice. Make it your devotion. 
Devotion says, this is what I do because this is who I am. So first, it's a matter of defining your allegiance. Then it's a matter of declaring your allegiance. But then you got to develop an inner circle. You, you got to develop people who you are connected to who keep pulling you in the right direction. This is for all of us, young and old. You need somebody who can tell when you're discouraged, when you're depressed. They can help you along. But that's not all. We have to develop a devotional life, a life where we practice things daily, consistently. We always do it. That's what I do. I've talked to you about what they did to have the character that they had. We explained and explicated their habits that made them, their character that made them who they were. But, but I, I wouldn't be done with the text if I did not tell you what God does in response to those who stand up for him. God is committed to those who stand up for him. The Bible goes on to say that three Hebrew boys refused to bow before the statue. They said, no, King Nebuchadnezzar, we cannot bow before the statue. We, we cannot do this because we are committed to something greater. No, King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not bow. And so they refused to bow. And so he kept his promise. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stoke the fire hotter. I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to make it bad for you. And he had guards grab them and throw them in. And the Bible says that when these guards threw Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, the Bible says that the fire was so hot that it killed the guards. So here they are in the fire. King Nebuchadnezzar is waiting for at least one scream, one holler. He's waiting for something to happen dramatic. He's waiting and he's waiting till finally he looks in. And when he looks in, he says, oh my God, didn't I tell y'all put three in there? He says, uh, I, I told you to put three in there, but I see four in there. I, I told you to put three in there, but I see four in there. And he said, and the fourth looks like the son of God, the son of man. I, I, I see four people in there, and, and that doesn't make no sense. So he says, Shadrach, Meshach, come on out, come on out. And when they came out, they had to do some explaining. And I come by to tell you a secret that's found throughout the scriptures. If you decide to stand for God, God says, I'll always stand for you. If you decide to make a stand for God, no matter the circumstance, no matter the difficulty, no matter the obscurity that will be required, if you stand for God, God says, hey, look, I'll always stand for you. You don't ever have to worry about standing for me and I not stand for you. Can I tell you a testimony? Uh, I was in a courthouse this week. I was in a courthouse, and, and I was there with a, a, a person who, who needed some prayer. That There was a difficult situation, and I watched God move in the courtroom. The prosecuting attorney started arguing for the person. The prosecutor, that's the person who's supposed to get you. He started arguing for the person not to get the sentence that they should have got. He said, well, Your Honor, I don't know if this circumstance is like the other circumstance. I, I don't think this person should to get all that they ought to get. And so the judge and the prosecuting attorney started debating the law. Well, doesn't the law say I have to do this? Uh, they said, well, no, the law says that you have to do this, but you can do it in other ways. So by the time the case was over, the young person walked out, and they're doing well because God stood for them. All I'm trying to say is decide today that you will stand for God. And God says, if you stand for me, I will stand for you. That's the witness of Jesus Christ. He's always standing for believers. In fact, the Bible says, I'm moving on, the Bible says in Acts that there was a man named Stephen and Stephen preached and spoke up. He was a deacon for God. And when he preached and spoke up for God, people started stoning him. And the Bible says they stoned him until in heaven, the Bible says that God was standing at the throne. Now that's problematic because God doesn't stand at the throne. He sits at the throne. But one time in the Bible, we see God standing at the throne. He's standing because he's standing for his servant. Whenever you stand for God, God says, I've got to stand for you. Whenever you do for God, God says, I've got to do for you. I won't let you outdo me. I won't let you beat me. You think you're doing for me? Watch me do for you. I've got more in my back pocket than you can imagine. You stand for me, and I'll stand for you. God says, I got you. Just stand for God. Just stand for God. Decide, I will stand for God. 
Not that I'll be popular. Not that I'll be loved by all the brothers in the college campus. Not that I'll be the most popular employer. But I'll stand for God. You decide to stand for God and watch God stand for you. We're standing to our feet. This is a message of resolve and resilience. And I hope that you don't limit it to some faith statement about 